Hello and welcome again to our series. Um, Being Responsible is, is doing this series on the US election this time and uh, we want to see how responsibly this time the media behaves. Being Responsible uh, is a kind of a campaign um, bringing out issues and problematizing the concept of responsibility, whether it's institutional or individual, or in fact, institutional and individual. And we kind of try to bridge the two. Um, for example, in media literacy, uh, or in this case, we're going to talk a little bit about something that we are going to call claim to representation, media bias, uh, for example, or perceived media bias in election coverage. In particular, I'm going to take uh, the con- the uh, the uh, ensuing U.S. elections as an example, and we are going to have somebody who's extremely um, well versed in this, as well as he's he's a he's a scholar. So as we talk about U.S. elections, we will talk about um, um, a a couple of things that our guest is um, going to be very, very, uh, it's very core to his uh, expertise as well. Um, For example, which way does the Indian American vote swing? Uh, uh, Indian Americans are going to be um, in the in the in the spotlight this time because the uh, the vice presidential uh, nominee from the Democrats is uh, partly Indian American. Um, a kind of a comparison of the U.S. and media uh, and Indian media's coverage of the 2020 elections, uh, and I'm serious about this because the Indian media seems to be you know kind of all you know uh, shrugging their shoulders and getting ready to cover uh, the elections because. It seems we are so involved in it as Indians uh, in the U.S. elections this time, thanks to Kamala Harris. And uh, what's changed in in the um, media coverage since the uh, 2016 fiasco? I mean, really, that's what it was, wasn't it? Where the media really failed to cover the elections, or at least the run-up to the elections, and then... um, uh, as, As the count was going on, they got it mostly wrong. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll touch upon that as well, and then whether and, and how things have changed. Um, as we welcome our guest today, uh, Dr. Manjunath Pendakur, he specializes in the political economy of the media um, and has served as professor and department chair at various universities, uh, including the Northwestern University in Illinois. Um, he mentored many doctoral students there. Um, he was the first Indian American to become dean at the University of Western Ontario. Canada, where uh, he established the under, undergraduate program, me, Media Information and Technoculture. Um, I mean, and this was way back. So that was very, very uh, seminal and central to what we have uh, carried forward today in terms of technoculture. Uh, he has served as dean at uh, the Southern Illinois University and also at Florida Atlantic University's Dorothy F. Smith, uh, Schmidt College of uh, Arts and Letters. He's authored four books, number of journal articles, and book chapters from his media research conducted in India, Africa, and North America. Um, before he emigrated to Canada in 1969, he worked in the Canada film industry, and he was a cinematographer for a CBS TV affiliate station in uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, he's maintained strong links to India, uh, to his family and friends, and, and that is something that we will pick his brains on uh, today as well. I'm interested in uh, Manju's analysis, both as a scholar of mediated communication, as well as a first generation Indian American immigrant voter. I mean, in some ways, the perfect American dream holder. Uh, In the process, we'll also talk about why the media's claim to representation is problematic. So here we go. Good morning, Manju, and welcome Welcome to this series. It's great to see you again. Good morning, Shashi. Thank you for having me to well, discuss such important topics. Yeah, I mean, isn't it exciting? This, this year, we're going to have um, uh, something momentous. It looks like um, the first uh, 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 vice, the, the first w- woman vice president in the United States could just be uh, an immigrant. Uh, or at least the daughter of immigrants. Um, and, uh, you know, as you can imagine, uh, the Indian media is uh, 
already cheering and 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 in part uh, you know advising and and uh, a whole lot of stuff is happening uh, in india just to bring you up to date what on, on what what the media is doing over here but in fact one one indian analyst uh, just today or yesterday has declared that there will be a major shift from a largely liberal vote among indian americans towards a conservative vote because many indian americans resonate with the current sentiment of you know well we can only call it bigotry but basically a, a sort of intolerance um supporting donald trump's anti muslim stance um as an indian american voter manju what is your analysis of the indian american vote in 2020 i think a lot of us have this question in mind wow that's a um fairly complicated question um i don't know i mean i don't know the response of the in, the broadly speaking indian mass media about uh, you know senator kamala harris being nominated for the party's vice presidential candidacy which is very very exciting of course but i didn't see anybody breaking coconuts in delhi for her just like they did back in uh, the time when trump got elected um so you may know a little more about it than i am aware of what's going on in some of the capitals in india but here there is considerable excitement both in the media as well as in the larger indian community about someone even if it is if she's only partly indian right 50% indian american good uh, enough for us it is great because this is like a milestone right she's she's standing on the shoulders of many great women and also men who fought for civil rights comes from a family of activists who fought for civil rights and then she has a great historical set of achievements so there is a, i think there's a lot of pride in the community as well but it is elections are complicated as you would very well know um the last numbers that i saw uh, 2020 estimates because we have not completed the census in this country yet based on the 2010 numbers and the estimates pew research center has put out um there are about 23 million registered voters who are immigrants of that there's only 3 million indians in the country not exactly. all of them are registered voters but the indian the as you could imagine the diaspora is always complex right you don't have only one overwhelming overwhelming set of votes that would go to a particular candidate it's a uh, fractured in terms of ideology in terms of uh, where you are located and those kinds of issues and also what they bring with them as baggage from india so if you just look at our numbers the majority maybe 60 to 65% of the 3 million are located in five states of the country yes. so some are in liberal states some are in not so liberal states for example texas and florida don't count as liberal states we have elected mostly republicans to the governorship and to their legislatures in the state and florida is also very complicated you know where i live in the sense that most of the immigrants here or from you know central the islands the caribbean islands and also central and south american nation states so they generally speaking come with very conservative ideas because they have fled you know whatever existed in those nations like brazilians or venezuelans so this election i don't really think it's easy for the democrats to swing it the swing states like florida and texas are going to be very tricky and you take that into account of our community and then on top of that you put this layer of gerrymandering the districts that has happened under the republicans and the manipulation of uh, voting you know boots etc etc uh we don't even know how much intervention will take place from putin's russia but right. afraid of that so given all of that um both biden and harris have a very tall order right to win this election 
That's and so our, our community is very complicated, as you well know. Oh, yes. I mean, and, and it's been fractured as well. I mean, it's not as if all the Indian Americans are going to vote Democrat. Uh, there was a time when uh, the, well, the, basically the Latino mix uh, of voters, but, is in, in, uh, but especially the Mexican Americans would vote overwhelmingly Republican, but right. that seems to have changed uh, the opposite direction. Whereas the Indian American vote um, seems to have been fractured. I mean, I have met so many Indian Americans in, in, the, in the state of New York that were, that have stayed Republican, uh, Trump or not. Uh, and, and, um, and that's carried forward. So, so a lot of the issues of, of immigrant votes, uh, would you say, are based on local and um, national factors and not necessarily for, uh, for eth eth ethnicity reasons. Would you, would you what, what, what do you well, think? You, you, I think it is understandable why Mexican Americans would have shifted for the most part towards Democrats. Because from the beginning of the primaries in the 2016 election, Trump's campaign has depended on this very historic idea of, you know, demonizing immigrants, calling them, you know, calling the Mexican Americans, especially rapists and murderers and drug dealers, you know, they call them mules, all sorts of names. So I can understand that. Whereas the same level of attack has not taken place on the Indian diaspora that exists in North America, because there is the sense that meritocracy you know, we are the exemplars of the meritocracy and the American dream, which right. is, you know, to a large extent, a mirage. But yeah. that sells really well with well, the Indian Americans who have done so well in this country. And they are the ones who would oppose any kind of affirmative action or a semblance of an affirmative action for African Americans and Hispanics in this country. So um, all elections tend to be local. National elections take on primacy only when there are these burning issues between the two parties. I think we have, we're at a point now where there are burning issues every day, literally burning issues, right? right? You know, people being killed on the streets, Trump encouraging, you know, neo-Nazis to go and, you know, uh, take on weapons and demonstrate in Portland, Oregon. So I think this is a different moment compared to 2016. Which way it is going to swing, it is, again, Anybody. tough to bring. That's, that's well put. Um, it for, for uh, you know, we, we, India, we, we sometimes get hyper-nationalistic about this uh, ethnicity stuff. Because remember that uh, Trump began his whole advertising campaign by showing Modi in his images, uh, for one, and and then uh, uh, kind of projecting Nikki Haley, who's also the daughter of uh, Indian uh, immigrants, uh, mm. yeah. and 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 she, um, you know, continued the orchestra, so to speak, by actually bringing up her ethnic background. I mean, how is eth ethnicity actually playing up? Uh, in the in the whole narrative, I mean, you said you said something very interesting. You said uh, it sells well. I mean, certain certain narratives seem to sell well. Is ethnicity a narrative now that's selling well? Uh, yes, to to some extent it is. You you see, the thing is, you it is very hard for the Republicans to speak on the one hand. Uh, to take back America to the 1950s, you know, to the, you know, the end of the Jim Crow kind of a period. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, speak about um, how to win the fractured electoral communities yep. in terms of ethnicity and race. So um, if you, if they're trying to sell the idea of, um, ethnicity of the candidates really hard in the national politics, it may not really work very well for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the Democrats, which is a very big tent of race, ethnicity, gender, all sorts of complexities of this society represents, 
it is a very good selling mechanism. Um, and Kamala Harris has done a great job of representing herself. But as Nikki Haley was so poor in articulating it, just like that guy from New, you know, <laughs> Louisiana, who well, just he fell apart very quickly. So I think it is probably, I'm being very hopeful today, that Kamala Harris could do a better job in reaching into the community right. uh, of people who would support um, a return to a time when the United States was the leader of the world. Right. And also, you know, there was certain uh, social net kinds of policies domestically, which we all crave for, like the Medicare for all or social security benefits and Medicaid benefits for the poor, better support for education, and you know, simply the critical issue of uh, electing judges who are progressive, or at least liberal-minded, if not leftist. So those are critical issues for those of us who are on the left of the political spectrum. Right. Uh, in your analysis or in your thinking, is it valid for, I mean, I know you, maintained a good understanding of India through the years, through, you know, relatives, probably visits to India, etc. I just wanted to know if you think that India's claim to Kamala Harris is valid to the extent that India is going to gain substantially because Kamala, if Kamala Harris becomes the vice president. Uh, and if so, in what way do you think India is going to benefit per se? Oh, I am a very skeptical person about this because I'm looking at this from the paradigm of how one studies America's imperialist adventures around the world. Right now, the, kind of, the central contradiction in terms of global relationships is between the United States and China. Yes. And, you know, they're beefing that up, right, as, an art, as a political weapon to uh, get the electorate to vote one party versus the other. Yes. Um, now, will Biden continue the same trajectory that uh, Trump has been on? I doubt it, because um, you know he has a different style, different historic experiences. He brings a lot more to the table than Trump ever did. Trump so you're not going to see. So you're not going to see Howdy Modi's under Biden. <laughs> Absolutely not. So it won't be like a trivializing of politics. It'll be very complex. But my guesstimate about this is that the U.S. will just simply fall back to the time when it had this great ambition to be the supreme power of the world. See, this has been the Democrats' mantle for a long time. Ever since 1945, they've carried this mantle, right? The one, you know, they claimed that they won the Second World War, they became the superpower, consequently they could run the world. That is not a simple fact anymore. It's much more complicated than it was just 25 years ago. So Biden, is, Biden and Harris are going to come into that picture, which is very, very different. You have a much more powerful Europe led by Germany. And you have India and China. India is not a, it has a lot of poor people, but it is also a technological power. It has a tremendous uh, you know, the population base of, of young people who are uh, going to be productive in their life, hopefully, right, with the, the correct economic approach, is going to be a formidable, you know, competition in the world. And so consequently, can they play the same game that they did by pitting India with Pakistan and Pakistan on the China side? I think it'll be a much more complicated formula. Right. Will Kamala Harris be an intelligent player in this? I am very doubtful of that because Kamala Harris does not have any foreign policy experience. Mm -hmm. She may have emotional attachments through family to all their her cities in Madras yes. <laughs> or different parts of Tamil Nadu, yes. but she doesn't really have that kind of experience or clout in the party yet. But that's a, that's a clever thing, isn't it? Because she, she can use the emotional connect and she, she used the word, 
she used the word chitis for a reason because it balances her earlier statements about Kashmir very well. And she was not very, um, uh, uh, she was not high praise about what's happening in Kashmir and the fact that there's been a lockdown in Kashmir and then um, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a freedom problem uh, in Kashmir because, um, because of uh, various reasons. And then we wanted to integrate Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, that is the Indian uh, side of it. Uh, into India, and the world was watching. And Kamala Harris was one of those uh, one of those critics who 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 reacted very strongly to it. Um, so you're saying that while emotionally she might be connected, diplomatically it's going to be very different. I mean, I mean, and and, and as you're saying that um, as a playground for diplomacy, Kamala Harris might not be the best bet in any case because she doesn't have that kind of experience. Uh, I'm. You know, I'm yet to see what kind of a team that he's going to bring to the foreign policy establishment. Will the old Democrats that followed the earlier pattern of trying to dominate the world return to Washington, D.C. and run the institutions? Or will it be a new breed of people that would say, well, you have two contending superpowers in the world. Let's make peace with China. I'm not sure what role Kamala Harris is going to play. Interesting. Kashmir, whatever she said at that point in time, did not win her many uh, affectionate, you know, responses from the Indian diaspora in the United States. Interesting. Um, and I was proud of the fact that she actually made some comment about that because most of the American politicians don't want to venture into that. I think if you take that and and let's say if they come to power, they would have to deal with this formidable power that uh, Prime Minister Modi has accumulated in the country. And the, my, my, sen, my own uh, listening of friends and relatives and reading, the, reading into the Indian media's coverage of his power now, despite the screw-ups that, that happened before you know, the COVID, rise right. of the COVID-19, he has accumulated enormous power since right. the COVID response. So that popular appeal that uh, Prime Minister Modi has and his party's control, except for a couple of states in the nation, the politicians in Washington will weigh that against their own position on Kashmir. They're not, my feeling is they're not going to take a great deal of risk with Kashmir. Mm -hmm. And their primary you know, interest will be in South Asia to win India to their side. Mm -hmm. if, if you take the old paradigm of balancing the two superpowers, India plays a, has a great position in it. Yes. It's not Pakistan anymore. Pakistan is, a, is not as nimble as India is. No. And, and, and there's been a, a, you know, a falling out of favor as well. Uh, since Hillary Clinton was the, um, uh, you know, you, you took, took active interest in kind of dismantling a lot of what uh, the, the favors were from the United States way back in the early part of last uh, decade. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but really, in, in, in Kashmir, I mean, beyond the dynamics of India-Pakistan, the, the integration of the Jammu and Kashmir area into India itself has been contentious to the extent of human rights violations or alleged uh, human rights violations. And that's where uh, Kamala Harris actually made a remark. And the United States getting into the human rights would be a very democratic thing to do, wouldn't it? It would be, and it would be consistent with uh, the policy positions that President Carter, you know, took on ever since uh, the 1976 period. However, the Biden camp in all their public pronouncements have not really made a big deal about the human rights situation in the world. The, the rhetorical strategy that they have pursued for this election is we will regain the prestige that America has lost. Well, that seems to have an appeal to the independent, so-called independent voters who are sitting in the middle between the two parties. 
they can switch their allegiance to any party at any time. Yeah. So in the general election, that kind of broader brush, you know, with that uh, may work. I'm not sure. sure. Because human rights and civil rights uh, campaign that the Democrats took on ever since the 1970s really did not work out in okay. my view. Especially, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, even under President Obama, they've destroyed what existed in the Middle East. I mean, I don't support dictatorships, but destabilizing Libya intentionally has completely ruined the whole, you know, the formula that existed there. So instability is the norm in the Middle East now. And what Trump has done is, ne is nearly permanent, giving the Golan Heights for yeah. nothing in return, giving Jer Jerusalem for nothing in return, has is very difficult to dismantle. Sure. So if you're going to talk about human rights in Kashmir, you'll have to talk about human rights in Palestine. Elsewhere. Elsewhere. They cannot, I don't think electoral strategy will allow them to do that now because you need the Jewish vote. Um, you know, switching to- Not the just the Jewish vote, I must say, you see an evangel evangelical vote that supports Israel and you know the hegemony of Israel in the Middle East. Um, Manchu, uh, we want to switch to the media side of things and I don't know media coverage and um, we've been talking about this thing called uh, claim to representation where the news media somehow believe that they have um, undertaken themselves as this um, communicator for us as um, if you want to call us the subalterns, uh, if you will, and then the media is our uh, articulator, uh, so to speak. Somehow that seems to be the narrative across whether you look at the US media or the Indian media, there's a claim to representation in some ways. But at the same time, the other thing that's happening is bots. That's the other thing that's happening is social media. The, I mean, whether we like it or not, it is a democratization of the, of the, media, of the communication space to a, to a large extent. A lot of it may not be to our liking. So how much representations actually uh, the mainstream media are uh, doing, especially given the fact that it uh, utterly failed in 2016 to, to, to do exactly that. I mean, they did not have enough penetration in the back of beyond of Iowa, for example, or, or the coal mines of Ohio to be able to even understand what was going on behind the scenes. And therefore the Trump, uh, you know, the, Trump coming uh, to power was a big surprise to the media, not just for us. So, so I think I find that claim to representation problematic. How do you think that's, uh, uh, that's changed? I mean, first of all, do you think the US media channels have kind of hardened their stance against Donald Trump for a reason? Is that also a form of represent, representing the people or is it just out of their emotional reaction to how they're being treated by Trump? Well, uh, let's, um, let's parse this out a little bit. When we, when we say the United States media, you have the oh. established you know, corporate uh, television news channels on the one hand, right? CNN, Fox, and MSNBC, and a variety of others that are and, big. Yeah. So on right? both sides of the spectrum as well. Let's, right. let's, yeah. And then you have a huge number of newspapers, uh, conservative like uh, Wall Street Journal, to liberals like uh, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post under Jeff Bezos' ownership, or the LA Times, and you know, there are some great newspapers in the country still. But if you historicize this, back in 2015 when Trump was simply trying to you know, look like he was a real candidate, the television news media just played along, just played along. It was just sickening for me to see for a whole year, they gave him billions of dollars worth of free advertising in space and, and the megaphone for his ugly name calling and destroying his own opponents within the party and essentially destroying the old conservative party in the, in the process, right? 
he has created a Trump, you know, Republican Party. They're Trumpistas. Um, and that, I, if you keep that in the back of your mind, what has changed, I think, in the last three and a half years is that it is simply not just the New York Times, which has gone after much more rigorously and digging up you know, information about the machinations in Washington, D.C., destroying the institutions and the customs and traditions, but also subverting these, the basic mechanisms of how governance is done by the Trumpistas in various parts of the administration. They've done a fabulous job. Washington Post and the New York Times. So the lead in, historically, you know this really well after having studied the American media, the lead for television industry in this country is always the New York Times and the Washington Post. It's not by themselves. So New York Times, and so whatever happens in the newspaper or the record that day, you can hear it echoing through MSNBC and CNN today. I think the intervening variable in this is Fox. Mm -hmm. You know, big, powerful, they have the ratings still, they're the lead in the TV ratings game. And they played that game really well for all through Murdoch's time and his son's time now, right? Ownership actually matters. But the other variable in this is very, very significant in this country. I don't think this happens in India. You could correct me if I'm wrong about this. We have a huge number of right-wing radio stations that basically pump conspiracy theories into the public consciousness. Yeah. So there's well, we have, two chambers. We have our television channels to do that. So we don't need yeah. radio anymore. But <laughs> gotcha. and, and that's that's probably one of the reasons that radio still doesn't have, that doesn't deal with talk, doesn't have that many talk shows or uh, uh, they don't disseminate news in any case, but but it's, television it's, channels yeah. are are up there in in conspiracy yeah. theories as well. Yeah, right. So um, yeah, the, particularly the vernacular media in India, it's like uh, particularly Hindi belt states. Hindi, Canada, Canada is just as bad. Yeah, really. Oh yeah, yeah. And they're own, they're owned by the TV18 group uh, or some of, yes, they are. That the Asianet the I mean, it's a mix, Z, um, and then there are some local ones. So it's, it's a mix. Yeah. It doesn't matter, it seems, because again, they're playing to the gallery by claiming to represent them. Right. So once you get on the road in this country and you turn on the radio, you know, the 50,000 watt stations are dominated by those voices that support anti-immigrant, you know, hysterics that Trump actually puts out in, on his Twitter feeds every day. Um, so I think there are these three groupings of media in this country that battle out for ideas in the public sphere. When I speak about the liberal media, like, uh, you know, New York Times, Washington Post and CNN, I don't think they have penetrated into areas of the nation where actually people who live there who have lost their livelihood because of globalization because of uh, not globalization under Obama, but globalization all the way back from uh, Reagan's time, they should be voting for Democrats, but they don't because the whole rhetorical strategy is to turn that anger against, uh, you know, the so-called swamp and the immigrants and the minorities in this country. So draining the swamp which Trump used had a very significant meaning for middle America, which was transmitted much more on, on, on radio and especially AM radio, uh, probably even FM radio, um, than television could ever do, right? I think so. I think so. The radio in this country, both the AM and FM, in most parts of the nation, whether you talked about uh, you know, rural Iowa or rural Indiana, they have played the most significant role in reinforcing the racist ideology that both parties subscribed for a long time. I must tell you, Democrats are not without fault in this. And 
uh, segregating uh, the you know the voters, all of that stuff. So it has played bringing, right bringing it back. This. Yeah. So th yeah. so in this in these four years, they've brought it back, which is you know we we have not moved forward from there. Earlier, even slavery was a reality, as was, for example, in India, um, the Hindu-Muslim divide was very politically kosher, actually. Uh, but today, we want to move away from that, but, but to bring it back to, to the older narrative seems to be the problem, isn't it? it is, it's a huge problem, because uh, I don't think they can win this, bringing it back in, to the extent that they are thinking of bringing it back. Mm -hmm. Because history cannot be reversed to that deep success. Because there are, uh, going back again to the numbers in this country, um, you know, the, his, the Spanish speakers are in very, very large numbers. They're spread out across the country. They're both in rural areas as well as in big cities. The African Americans are not just congregated in uh, rural areas like they used to be in the 1950s. They're in big cities across yeah. the nation. And one of the things that we, you know, we always stereotype the South, but the South is not the same it used, used to be. You know, these Southern states, which are very conservative, right. even Mississippi took down the flag, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the old flag that celebrated Dixie or, you know, the Civil War okay. and the old, old guard, the old order of the South, they took down the flag. So, I think we have made some gains even in the South. You know, the liberal democracy idea has made inroads because the population shift is a significant issue. I go to, for example, if I go to t Tennessee and I go to smaller towns, I can eat international uh, inter restaurants that serve international food. That was not the case just wow. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So one is the population shift of uh, African-Americans and Hispanics. The other really important aspect is the younger people in America don't buy into this crap to the extent that their parents did. Yes. So you have younger, I mean, you can see this in the demonstrations, particularly after the killing of, uh, you know, George, George, in, uh, George Floyd in, um, you know, in Minnesota, you have gigantic demonstrations that have huge number of white kids. Yes. And you know, older white people as well. So that is a shift that I'm very yeah. happy to see. It's a kind of a shift that we are seeing in India as well. Just yesterday, uh, the prime minister uh, delivers a radio message called Man Ki Baat, which is basically straight from the heart or whatever it is. Uh, yes. And it's the first time I have ever oh, seen the, the idea from FDR. Oh yeah, sure. But and and even right up to Obama, Obama did it too, right? Uh, but in any case, for the first time in six years, I saw. Um, apparently more than 300,000 unlikes or dislikes to, to, the, to the tweet on that and, uh, and, and there are very few likes in comparison, probably just 25% of that. Uh, and, and most of these, as, as somebody has analyzed this, were from students. Um, the students uh, seem to ha you know, uh, have kind of gone over that entire narrative and then they're on the other side of it almost where they're looking at it and thinking wait what's happening here and uh the, they're starting it looks like to take a step away from that especially because of what happened uh with you know in december and january of, of uh with december of last year and that january of this year in delhi where student protests were suppressed and that's the worst thing you can do to students right um so that's something that so I'm saying that regardless of that, the the vo 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 vocality or vocalness of that movement is starting to show itself in various ways. And so it's interesting you should bring up the younger uh, generation, how they are responding to this. This is all BS. I don't care. I mean, just give me this kind of thing is also seemingly starting to happen uh, here in India. Uh, that's very, very uh, significant that you should say that. That's an encouraging sign for sure, because if you go back to December and all those uh, protests that were organized by the young people in Delhi and other places, it spread to all the smaller towns as well. And how the attacks on Jamia Emilia took place and the propaganda against anyone that opposed the, C 
you know, citizenship uh, bill and all that stuff, being calling them nat urban naturals, that really destroyed a momentum. It, it, it completely did. And also it kind of hurt the sentiments of students who, were, who always believed that protest was a form of uh, expression and, and, and so right. on and so forth. Um, but coming back to, you know, how, how bub, you know, filter bubbles and echo chambers are created and then, you know, the, the national narrative then is um, via the media, right? I mean, you know, you can protest all you want on the streets like uh, apparently, um, government employees or railway employees and, and, and some other employees are starting to do, but nobody's covering them um, because the narrative is, is not in their favor. Uh, do you think that the U.S. media, uh, for example, has done a fair job of covering Trump? Uh, you mean so far? In the, let me, let me, since the election? election? Or so far, but also let me rephrase that. Does the media play to sentiment in the sense that does it play more in terms of um, uh, representing the audience in terms of uh, the agendas that they set, which are fair? You know, if, if the agenda is acceptable to the nation, that's an agenda that the media probably should be showing anyway. But on the other hand, are they playing to a sentimental agenda, which is, um, for example, um, an actor died about, uh, I don't know, about 70, 70 days ago in India. And then there's been a huge furor because there's been a lot of controversy surrounding his death. His name is Sushant mm. right. and, and day in and day out, I remember the days when uh, the US media covered um, um, the Rodney King uh, uh, killing and then OJ Simpson, uh, the, the, the car chase, etc. You remember that, uh, where the it seemed that they were all just following him and not trying to really catch up. You remember those scenes then? So yes. I, I think, I mean, yes. yeah, so, so that, that kind of live coverage uh, in India has brought to the fore a whole lot of analytical um, prowess to, to the media where they think that we can analyze better than anybody else. So they're bringing a whole lot of analysis to a certain thing that has caught the fancy of the people. In the process, are they really ignoring uh, real political issues and real economic issues? That's a, that's a point that, uh, that can be debated forever because they do actually cover them. They cover them at, uh, at, at prime time. They cover uh, those agendas or, the, or those items of agenda while everybody else is watching. That is the moot point. But last, you know, right now, the bots have to take a lot of the blame for, uh, for actually creating these uh, eco chambers. And then also then the media, mainstream media picks those agendas up from the, from the social media, doesn't it? So that, that seems to be uh, the trend. So that's, my question was coming from the point of view of, is the US media really just uh, playing along? Uh, or do you think that there is something that they should do better in 2020 than they did in 2016? Just, just those two snapshot years. Oh, I think they're, they're doing better compared to 2016 um, for very obvious reasons, right? The obvious reasons meaning the liberal humanist tendencies that have existed in the American media are basically challenged mm -hmm. in the Trump paradigm. Um, and there is so much to say about that um, every day in the, in the and, and the fact that he has, he has accumulated a bunch of people, uh, some of them from the Indian diaspora, by the way, uh, to work for him, who are atrociously bad human beings, like, you know, Stephen Miller, for example, or Jared Kushner from the Jewish, community. So there's plenty to say about that every day. But I think the, um, the natural tendency about television news is to go where there is action. So if there is a demonstration, it always gets an attention, as opposed to someone making a, you know, uh, someone doing a very detailed analysis of public policy issues. So I have, I mean, I've always had a problem with 24 hour news because I don't think it really added much to our understanding of how the society works, for example. It filled up the hours and there was profitability. 24 hours. Yes, 
and and it uh, really turns off a lot of people from watching TV news, at least in this country that has happened. And so, and what that, what that led to is this um, clear demarcation of uh, liberal versus right wing media in this country. You know, Fox representing one you know set of ideas and the liberal media representing an amorphous set of ideas from the other side. Exactly. Right. So in the middle, what has happened, I'm really scrunching a whole lot of stuff into this one statement, is that if you take, for example, the disaster that COVID-19 has been on certain racial minorities and the poor in this country, um, that story has been told really well in the popular media, right? News, both newspapers as well as television news, because it is such a heartbreaking story. But then I say, well, let me find a lot of stories about what it has done to Native Americans, you know, the indigenous communities that are living in terrible poverty in Arizona, for example, or New Mexico. And they have taken the brunt of this hit because there are no clinics, no doctors around. They got to travel 100 miles to see a doctor and they don't have clean water. So I would like to have seen a lot more, you know, live coverage in the, from those communities on CNN, for example. So there's always slippage in what they do. And the, the problem with contemporary politics is that Trump is incredibly good in setting the agenda. Every day, he sets the agenda for national coverage and cameras go wherever they are, despite the fact that he openly calls them liars and, you know, fake news and you're a terrible person, you're nasty. I mean, no one had ever done that to the media, right? They hated the media. Even Nixon, who hated the media deeply, would never publicly say that. So he's a different breed of politician. He's not a politician. He's a, he's a you know, a circus barker, so to speak. Um, but the, the popular media in this country, meaning corporate media, has taken that hit. And, but they have to take the hit in order to get access to him in the White House. Otherwise, you would be barred from appearing in all the press conferences. So they are using the power to manipulate the media in the best way they can. Uh, as a communicate, you know, as a communication scholar and as a communicator yourself, how do you see? Uh, you just said Trump sets the agenda beautifully. That's what Modi does here as well in India. Do you think that there's a difference in the way that Trump has become somehow so unpopular? In in if you look at the ratings as opposed to Modi, whose popularity chart seems to be going up all the time, despite many, many failings. I mean, starting from demonetization, which was decried by eco uh, economists, uh, economists all over the world, from that to the way that um, uh, freedoms have been compromised with, and, and, and or at least allegedly, or at least symbolically, you know, by, by arresting symbols of, uh, you know, of protest or dissent and, make, and making them exemplars of, uh, this is what's going to happen to you if you do this kind of, kind of setting the fear tone. Uh, maybe that's, that's one of the reasons that that could be the rider here. But what do you think, Panju, is the difference in the factors that govern Trump's declining popularity versus Modi's rising popularity? Because I mean, I, just to clarify for our viewers, both are, you know, in, in, in their own ways, ultra right, aren't they? I, I mean, I would quarrel with this concept called uh, popularity. Um, because with Trump, as president, he commands the attention of the media. Whether he says the worst possible things that come out of his mouth or not, he still would command the attention of the you know, the, the, both the press as well as television news and the internet. So that's a given. Same thing happens with uh, the Prime Minister of India. 
<clears throat> I don't think we have good measures to assess one's popularity or not through television ratings. Um, I think they're, they're one, you know, one factor that you can look at, but they're not the real factor. I think they're not, they don't capture everything. Sure. For example, I live in a really nice neighborhood in Boca Raton. We have the only lawn sign, you know, in, in the United States, we put up lawn signs to support our candidates. So it's, it's a little uh, like a, an eight by, uh, 10 by 12 you know, <laughs> image or a message yeah. to say, well, I support this candidate. We were the, uh, we're the only candidate, we're the only household that has a lawn sign to support a local democratic candidate that's running for a state legislature position. So when the Harris Biden signs become available, I'm gonna go and give them 35 bucks and bring the lawn sign, put it up on my lawn. I bet no one in our neighborhood have that sign because they've all voted for Republicans in the past and they're covert voters. They're ashamed of what they've done, but they support him ideologically. So it's a very, very tough bargain to assess, you know, where the public stands with respect to a national leader. That's why we always say social science, we, we predictions are always dangerous, right? Yeah. But going back to style, uh, which is a good question in terms of how leaders can amass, you know, an audience for themselves. Um, Trump has sold the idea that he speaks his mind. He's not afraid of style or tradition or whatever it is, niceness. So there is a section of the public, educated versus also uneducated people in this country, meaning people without college degrees. I shouldn't call them uneducated, but they, are, they don't have college degrees. But the, in both groups of people, there are people who think that he speaks his mind and politicians don't speak their mind. So they have that kind of a mirror in their head about how to pit him against politicians who lie while he's lying constantly. In the same sentence, he'll lie twice. Whereas Modi, I watched him on YouTube, many of his speeches across the nation that he gave to get elected. His rhetorical strategy is brilliant. He can stand there, talk for hours, spin tales, and he's uh, not as poetic as Vajpayee was, but he has these particular style that has this dramatic appeal to thousands of people that sit there and in the baking sun, listen to him. So I think that training that he got at the RSS as a Pracharak has come to his help a great deal. Trump has none of that. Absolutely not. He cannot even complete a good sentence. Right. But as Modi is, He's not good at English, but he's really good in speaking the colloquial Hindi that he speaks, which is probably mixed with some of that uh, Gujarati in it. <laughs> so they're very different personalities, very different styles, and Trump would never succeed in speaking to a large audience like this without a script. He needs something to read. When he reads, he's terrible. Yeah. When he speaks his mind, it's intolerable, but he speaks his mind, so to speak. And but as Modi, yeah. but as Modi can hide behind his flowery language yeah. and the poison that he spreads is buried in it. So I think he's a much better communicator compared to Trump by any, by any standard. I think therefore that the communication is, is the big difference why there is uh, a difference in the ratings or the popularity ratings or whatever. And I, I, I know that we should take this with a pinch of salt. And yet that seems to be a kind of a narrative driver in itself in that people who watch and see, oh, this guy is just gaining in popularity. Let me explore what he has to say and why he's so popular. I mean, just to use one of those communication theories, this kind of perpetuates his popularity and probably snowballs as you go along. And for, for, 
for sure it it can't diminish his popularity as a rate as channel after channel propagates this popularity uh, chart whereas trump actually almost seems to be uh, swimming against the tide here and and succeeding in doing that because people actually uh, uh, could be rating him higher than they rate the media which could be one of the problems right yes and one of the significant things that has happened in the last four or five years uh, from the primaries that took place in 2015 through the election and now is that uh, Trump has succeeded in destroying the media's credibility. I'm, I'm talking about the corporate media's credibility. There is other alternative media, you know, the New Yorker magazine or the Atlantic and the Nation magazine, et cetera, that is read by a smaller sliver of the, you know, readership in this country. Uh, New York Times is not read in rural areas of Indiana, right? Unless it is Indiana University audience. So um, I think the, the other important thing that we are experiencing since uh, Trump's election is, or you, I'm sure you see this in the same situation in India, is that um, the so-called numbers related to both um, you know, uh, polls that are taken, as well as uh, responses to tweets, et cetera, et cetera, which are numbers that are taken and put out as news items on, you know, big media like the CNN has been very detrimental to politics in this country. Because sure. they don't represent really anything. Yes. They represent, if, especially if you got bots <laughs> running the show, they represent what? They represent manipulation, not truth by any means. So, you know, I just don't pay attention to polls because polls are all politics. Polls are based upon a very small number of people that they make telephone calls to these days. Well, how many people have landlines in the United States, right? Only older people with, you know, like they go to, they go to the polls to vote and those people are assessed but not the younger people who have cell phones. They're never called in the polling situations. So they don't represent the reality in its complexity at all. Matu, I have to let you go there because we've spent, you, you, you've taken so much uh, time to, to uh, address so many issues on uh, the US elections. And you know what's interesting is that those parallels, we keep coming back to, you say something and then it, it rings a bell because a parallel seems to be happening in India as well. I think that was the most fascinating part of our conversation. But uh, uh, thank you very much for your time, Manju. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Shashi. Always, you always take care and happy moving, okay? You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.